guess the question for all three of you really is, is before we get into the Slido q and is you're, uh, that sort of learning from other jurisdictions and learning from other countries and you know, there's obviously some aspects of what you might see in another country are, are really applicable in your own situation, but, but then it's always the kind of 5% differences which, which make that kind of just applying what you've done elsewhere really kind of complicated. I wonder if you have any general reflections on that point. Um, first of all, either Stephanie, Stacey or Stefan, if you are still unmuted, you may want to take that. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very specific to where you operate. Um, trying to find like a, a one size fits all solution uh, because technology, you know, is so expensive to make and then trying to apply that somewhere else. Very difficult if you go into a uh, like campaign level um, uh, operation. Uh, like uh, what uh, you just presented is uh, the trying to come up with um, like boundaries and a database that keeps them. I think my society, you also have um, like a project that has like boundaries and you can manage them or something like that. And that is super helpful. And I think that can be redeployed uh, a lot. But as soon as you go further and like try to like um, get the data in um, yeah, either you have to scrape it, you have to get it somewhere else, you have to FOI it maybe, and that is all very specific. So you, know, you can't run a civic tech project from a different country basically, right? That's uh, not possible. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we agree, we've, we've tried and we wonder. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just, uh, sorry to interrupt, I'll just, I'll just echo that. We, um, the, one of the hardest things that we've encountered is um, learning about local legislative district data from other countries. Um, we've had uh, a couple expansions recently. We, we started covering about the 54 largest cities in Canada, um, and we learned of some wacky things that had gone on with like merged local districts um, in a couple jurisdictions that we weren't familiar with. Um, and we took on a, an expansion in Mexico a few years ago and, you know, First of all, you have to have folks on the team that that speak those languages and that can help you dive through, uh, you know, constitutions and local uh, local referendums and just things that are hard to understand when you're not there uh, locally. Yeah, just I'm just going to paste in a, a blog some of you may seen from Democracy Club here in the UK, the 4,314 times when postcodes aren't good enough because you are the, the ways that different jurisdictional boundaries kind of overlap and just all the kind of craziness that flows from that. And is that without that kind of fun foundational infrastructure, it's very difficult to build other kind of services on top of it. You know, that's what's been behind government digital service in the UK and other countries and all those kind of initiatives. And um, so we've got a couple of specific, quite a few specific questions, uh, some for Stefan, some uh, for Cicero as well. Um, so Stefan, top um, question on Slido, I don't know if you've seen it, but has, has uh, this project had any effect on food safety reports being more easily public available by default? You covered some of that in the presentation, but just anything you want to add on that, I guess. So the food safety reports are generally not public in Germany. They are made public if um, the fine for the report uh, is above uh, a certain threshold, like 300 euros, then they have to be published. But, and they are published then on like some weird portal somewhere and they're only published for like two months or something. And um, so every time I go to a portal, I, there's never anything there. So it's, it's a bit suspicious. I'm not quite sure if I'm always at the wrong point in time. Um, but uh, yeah, the, we just hope to change the legislation as, as such. And um, the idea is also to uh, standardize these tests. Uh, Denmark has like one system, you know, you have this report card, it has a smiley system. In Germany, every district is free to you know, come up with their own kind of uh, way to uh, formalize that report, um, which makes them not comparable, which makes the publishing them difficult because then the consumer actually can't tell, you know, what is good, what is bad, or what, which one is better between these two. So standardization is definitely a problem. Um, and I think, but we started a conversation here and we kind of forced started it, right? Because suddenly, you know, we make these uh, reports uh, public and they're already like more than uh, 2,000, 3,000 are online already. And they're sometimes handwritten and whatnot. So we show like how broken the system is right now. And we hope to kickstart a conversation about um, making them standardized and also making them uh, public by default. Great. And just one, one very quick one. How do you go about classifying the authority reactions? Is that entirely manual, semi-automated combination? 
So um, we looked at the top authorities manually, we looked at their responses, um, and then we take like snippets from the responses and then we make them into regular expressions, you know, you know machine learning, you, you know, AI, right? Um, and then uh, we just try to find these snippets in other responses um, and like match them a bit. It's nothing fancy. And I think it, uh, it, it shouldn't be at that point, you know, we're not trying to create like a FOI robot or something. We, we have to understand like the, the consequences that are in there. And also um, we want to know about things that are different and not try to keep the, like treat them the same way as other things. We want to see uh, what's developing and then possibly also to just take, pick up the phone and call the authority and ask, hey, what are you doing there? And um, because that is sometimes more helpful than the canned response. Yeah. Definitely. So a couple of questions for um, Stephanie and Stacey. So um, Mika uh, Sifi was asking how many of the 519,000 US elected officials do you currently have and how much do you charge uh, for access to the data? Yeah, that's a great question. So we currently cover um, about 360 of the largest cities and counties in the United States and then another a little over 50 in Canada. Um, so we have total coverage of about 45,000 elected officials that extends uh, to all of uh, the different uh, countries that we maintain data for. Um, and in terms of how we charge for it, so there are a few different ways that people can access the data. We have an API, um, we have a district matching application which allows people to just upload a spreadsheet of addresses and get those matched. Um, they're all priced differently but our pricing is completely transparent on our website and we um, offer discounts for all nonprofits that want to use the data. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we have uh, a free tool that any individual can use. It's also on the website to look up their address and find all the elected officials that represent that location if we maintain that data. Um, and we've committed to never uh, charging individuals um, to find that information. Um, and lastly, I'll say we've worked with a number of students and academics and other organizations that just did not have the funds to pay for the data. Um, we've been happy to, to share some of that data with them for free. Um, and we also uh, try to have partnerships that can help people access uh, even more. So one organization that people might be familiar with is called TechSoup. Um, and through a donation program, a nonprofit um, can receive up to 5,000 API credits, which is uh, good for some uh, smaller and medium-sized nonprofits for a full year for, for just $30. Um, so when we say we try to make it reasonable and affordable, we, we really do, um, knowing that we need to continue to have um, some funding to operate the service, uh, we still try to prioritize uh, nonprofits and, and efforts that, um, that are going to be most impactful to people. Fantastic. And then another, uh, maybe not so brief, but a question from Alex Blanford about do you, what interactions have you had with legislatures, leg, legislators, sorry, and are they interested in helping to sort of improve the government process as a result? Yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll start off, but I'll turn this one over to Stacy also. Um, so we have had a number of interactions with legislators. I think the main takeaway is that they're super busy. And while they, uh, in many cases, care about their constituents contacting them, um, they don't have as much bandwidth to figure out how that's going to happen. Um, and they all have opinions about ways in which they want folks to contact them, and they might all be different. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'll let Stacy answer some of that question as well. Yeah, we attend a uh, conference every year of state legislators in the United States, um, and we try to pull them if we can to get a sense, because uh, a lot of nonprofits do ask us, like, what's the best way to communicate with our legislators? Um, and they're very busy. And so often, <laughs> the most common response is, don't, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> uh, often, like, tongue in cheek, they're joking. Of course, um, they want to speak with their constituents. Uh, they're often overwhelmed. They're very annoyed by like form letters that have like um, had a lot of uh, uprise in the resistance age um, and form email letters as well. They want to hear like real problems um, and have like dialogue if possible with their constituents and they kind of want to clear out the clutter of just like mass emails and letters. Um, they one like common um, and surprising answer we heard this year was about um, was texting and Facebook surprisingly. Um, and this was heard from a lot of um, rural uh, uh, legislators and um, they, I mean, good on them for sharing their personal cell phone um, number with their constituents, uh, but they found that this like through Facebook and texting was the most like direct form of communication and they were able to answer on the go, um, which is very surprising. 
and like I mean, impressive. Uh, we actually wrote up um, kind of a summary of our findings from this past year's conference, and I'm happy to share that link out to that sort of summary. Um, but yeah, I think overall we haven't had like mass action to like um, make this data more like available or standardized. Is that might have been where the question was heading, but um, we've had good interactions with understanding better how they like to be con contacted. Excellent. And then just one final question for uh, Stefan. Uh, and this is something we often come up against with uh, what do they know and other FOI services is you know, when you get lawyers involved, it's very expensive. And you know, the, the legal aspect, you're actually being prepared to go to court as part of the campaign seems like a, a core part of what you're trying to do. Is, I mean, how, how on earth do you fund that and what type of additional risk does that present for you individually and as an organization and so on? Yeah, so um, most of the time we win the cases we uh, go to court for and then we actually get some money back. Um, uh, problem is that lawyers, uh, they charge a bit more than the usual amount you get back, uh, especially for like fringe topics like FOI, unfortunately. Um, that's why we also hired our own lawyer now for our organization um, who can like, you know, who's then cheaper overall than just hiring some, some law firm here and there. We, we cycled uh, through, through a couple of law firms in order to get like an uh, impression of what the situation is like. Um, I mean, we, we do have donation funding. Uh, our supporters are quite happy that we do these lawsuits because they, we can show that they actually move the conversation forward, that we can uh, open up uh, uh, parts of uh, the government that were closed before just through a lawsuit so it's uh, we can show that it's worth it and so they support us through that and we also have um, foundation funding um, and it's apparently also convincing to them that uh, our strategic litigation part is uh, well worth it fantastic thank you and congratulations on using a pun for the name of the campaign I, i'm a strong believer that puns are the basis of any successful civic tech initiatives so it's uh, always good to see yeah, and, and amazingly it worked in both german and english <laughs> <It's perfect. laughs> listen thank you so much guys uh, stefan stephanie stacy two great presentations thank you for the questions thank you for turning up today it's really really very appreciated